Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. So in 1978, at the age of 24, he dropped dead and almost 40 years later is still here, not only to tell the tale, but to help educate the world on nutrition. Charles, or should I say CJ Hunt, is the executive producer, writer and host of not only the world's first paleo movie, but also a documentary providing proof of the authentic human diet that was previously unknown. I'm, of course, talking about the feature-length investigative documentary, The Perfect Human Diet. CJ Hunt, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much. It's uh, it's great to be here, Ellie. So your story is quite astounding. So am I right to say at about the age of 24, you just dropped dead? Yeah, I was a dirt bike racer. I was in motocross. I was in San Diego. And, you know, I had injured myself riding somebody else's bike and was out there training to get back in shape. And... Uh, it was at Beverly Hills High School, Memorial Day 1978, went a lap and a half and promptly dropped dead. So luckily, there was an anesthesiologist who came to go jogging that day who rescued me, gave me CPR until the uh, paramedics could get there. And they did the, you know, jump started me like you see on TV with the paddles, you know, and they transported me to UCLA Medical Center where I spent uh, 10 days in intensive care while they tried to figure out what was going on. And at 24, it's kind of a shock. Yeah. So what was going on? Well, the medical science has improved. At the time, they weren't 100% sure. And what they called it was a kind of a long term, which was idiotropic, hypertrophic, subaortic stenosis, which means basically, we don't know, but you've got this stenosis going on in your heart, which in my case, what it turned out to be is the center of my heart. The, the septum is twice as thick as normal, which makes my left chamber, the ventricle that pumps blood back out into your body, smaller. And so I had a physical problems that had started to manifest, and I also had electrical problems that were, uh, you know, I could be sitting at a desk and get all dizzy and just because my heart took off by itself. So that's kind of, kind of it. Now um, we know that that's a birth defect and that it runs in certain family lines. In fact, we found out my brother and my dad have it after we found out about me. So this, all you can do is learn how to work around it, you know, when it, when it, when it comes to it. But, uh, but yeah, it was quite a surprise. Amazing. And so you, I believe were given six years to live. So what are you doing here? (laughs) Oh, well, yeah, that's interesting. You know, they, they threw around a lot of numbers. It's like, You know, if I was to continue exercising and jogging, you know, at that time, they thought if I made it two, two and a half years, that would be pretty good. You know, and then, of course, other folks stretched it out a little bit. But, you know, I have a lot of friends that ask the same thing. Why are you still here? Uh, I'm sure they didn't mean it in a a derogatory way. They're just just teasing. (laughs) You know, I think I think a lot of it had to do with the interest in health and well-being that that incident you know, spawned in me. And I started uh, looking at everything I could and, you know, reading up on what was available at the time. Of course, this was pre-internet, so there, none of that was available. You actually had to go to store bookstores <laughs> and pick up a book and try to find things. And the ideas about health and wellness were very different than in many circles now, back then. So I ended up trying vegetarianism and raw food veganism and considered fruitarianism and all these kinds of things that supposedly would help your body function optimally. Yeah. In your uh, documentary, you mentioned that you tried low fat and every type of diet that was sort of existed at the time, which is a fair few. And then it seemed like though you stuck to the vegan diet for about five years or the raw food vegan diet. And then what what made you change after five years? Well, you know, I did um, partly because I thought, well, you know, if I don't really do it seriously, I'll never know if it works. I'm kind of experimental that way. And that at the time, the ideas behind it seemed really interesting. And I figured it couldn't be any worse than going to Jack in the Box and eating, you know, fish sandwiches every day. So (laughs) I didn't really think it was going to hurt me. So and I, I did that successfully. And I, you know, for about five years, and I felt pretty good on it. Most of the people who knew me that were vegans and vegetarians thought it was uh, interesting that I maintained so much muscle mass and whatnot. But I, like you, I was very uh, active and uh, doing whatever I could to capacity. And then um, 
my mother was killed by a drunk driver. And, you know, we both lived in San Diego. She was my best pal. And the, the emotional shock of that was such that after a while, I just didn't feel good uh, eating in the same fashion anymore. It was no matter how well-intentioned the idea of the vegan, raw food, vegan diet is and was for me, it just couldn't help me recover from that life trauma. And, you know, quite honestly, and I would tell friends that, you know, after a while, I just heard this little voice inside saying, you know, eat fish. Mm. (laughs) So I said, oh, (laughs) you know, and within a month of the time I started eating, you know, animal proteins again, I gained eight pounds of muscle and started recovering, you know, more physically, which was just not happening before that. So Mm. that that's the main catalyst of why I changed. But it also started me down, you know, new directions and learning more about health and well-being. Mm. And and you mentioned that you actually did have to get a a defibrillator place uh, put inside at the age of 46. And that sort of began your began your 10 year journey. Well, yeah, when I first you know, had my cardiac arrest, uh, pacemakers and things did not exist. And that was new technology that had come along. And my heart defect um, started getting worse in my 40s and uh, just getting hard, getting upstairs, all that kind of thing. And so I got, went to UCLA Medical Center. They, you know, they strap on, you know, some recorders so they can figure out what your heart is doing. And as it turned out that it was better uh, to have an implant uh, just to make sure that I, you know, didn't drop dead somewhere and they couldn't get me back. And um, as it turns out, they replace them every few years and whatnot. And I'm I'm on my third one now, and it's just a backup. I haven't needed it so far. Oh, great! So, which is <laughs> nice. But it was very dispiriting, you know. All of a sudden, you're, I don't know if in Hong Kong they they know much about the Borg, you know, Star Trek and the Borg, where you know human beings are partly mechanical. But when they first placed the uh, defibrillator on my chest, it was like having a big, you know, like half of your cell phone under a t-shirt. And it was very yeah. apparent. Yeah. So psychologically, it was a big hit, you yeah. know, at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what brought that on. And it actually forced me to finally take action to do the film. And because I had tried uh, chatting with other people in the Hollywood industry before to, you know, dig up some interest in the subject matter. And, you know, everybody has their own particular things they're interested in. So finally, I had to go back to school and learn uh, radio and television uh, documentary production. And in the course of school, during that whole period of school and the 10 years of, you know, writing it, researching it, learning what to do about it, and then starting the shoot. And then the shoot started in 2006, and the film finally came out in late December 2012. So it's essentially January 2013. But, you know, those things are a long road, you Mm -hmm. know, and part of that, of course, is fundraising. You know, it took two years to raise the money, even after most of it had been shot, to finish it. So... You know, that's kind of the quick arc of what happened with it there. So for those that haven't seen the film yet, which I'm sure they all will after this and they'll be crazy not to, can you describe <laughs> Can you describe how you deconstructed such a massive problem? You, you mentioned in the film three steps that you took to actually start working out, well, how do I even, how do I even go about looking at? Well, finding- yeah, you know, I went back to some advice my parents had given me when I had in a curiosity about any kind of subject matter. And the first thing was, well, you know, it's often best to go back to the beginning, you know, and see where that leads you instead of just assuming that what other people are talking about is accurate, you know, or true. And that'll, that taking that course of action will reveal things you never expected. And then you of course can look deeper into those. So I think that was probably the, uh, the main thing that sparked wanting to do it in this fashion. Plus the things, the few things that I had read, like Dr. Mike Eats Protein Power, he mentioned a little bit about the Paleolithic period. And this was before Rob Wolf and, you know, the paleo diet, Lauren Cardena, before any of this existed. And so I was very curious about finding out, well, you know, we should go back and start at the beginning and find out where it leads us, see what were human beings really eating, you know, how healthy were we when we ate those things, you know, if we change the way we eat at a certain point in time, what did it do to us, you know, and then even after all of that, well, if this is, as some say, the healthiest way to eat, is there anybody doing it? And can we take a look at what the results are? You know, so that's pretty much how that, you know, started up. It was just curiosity. 
you know, there was no book that I had to say that, you know, I'm going to try to prove this point. And most of the people I met during the course of the uh, documentary, I didn't expect to meet. The way it happened as a rule was, for example, I went to see Lauren Cordain in Colorado State University, and he's the fellow that wrote The Paleo Diet. And at the end of our interview, and the, as you, you recall from the film, we did this long section going up a football field and describing you know, the different stages of human evolution using a football field as the scale so that people could understand now um, what that really looked like. And at the end of that conversation, he said, well, you know who you need to go talk to, <laughs> you know, and this happened over and over again without me asking. And so that is really what guided the course of the uh, discovery, you know, and the investigation is that search for the perfect human diet. Mm. Well, for me, actually, that was probably one of the most exciting parts of the film was, or to me, was just seeing the analogy of the football field and the times and the, and the years and to see that you pointed out that 91 years ago, the like, industrial period was where I think you said 70% of our, our food diet now comes from, this tiny little period, tiny, tiny part of the football field compared to the rest of the, or going back for like 2 million years. Well, yeah, our early ancestors about 2 million years ago were the ones that started eating more and more animal foods. And the story of human evolution, I think often, you know, in health and fitness and things, we miss the point. But the point is, it's really the story of our becoming human. Why is there our species? Because 2 million years ago, there was not a human species. They were early ancestors to the human species. And it's only over this long course of time and eating and incorporating more and more animal foods, more animal fats, you know, the marrow from the bones and the brains and the, all of that kind of thing that we developed our own brains. And ultimately, somewhere between 160,000 and 200,000 years ago, we showed up, you know, so... Um, that's really kind of the thing that I try to get people to understand now is that this is how we became human. That's why there are humans here, and that's why we can fuss about what to eat, <laughs> you know, is only because our brains got big enough by eating, you know, animal foods did we uh, become who we are today. Yeah, exactly. And, and Michael Eads pointed out a couple of interesting points about that. He, he said, vegetarian is not the way of the man and that we have a carnivorous GI tract. And he actually proves that. Well, yeah, I think that that's really, you know, that's one of the interesting things to clarify because, of course, in the vegan world and vegetarian world, there's, um, you know, when people believe things, they really look for ways to justify them and or prove them. And it's not always based in rigorous science and part of, in fact, one of the girls I, uh, that I interviewed at the International Vegetarian World Festival in the film, you might recall, said that, yeah, yeah, is that, you know, we're not really carnivores, we're herbivores, you know, that we aren't meant to eat meat, but that's a misunderstanding. It's almost yeah. like a religion. And, and I remember in the, in the documentary, Barry Sears says that nutrition is like religion and politics. It's based on a belief system rather than facts. And that was really interesting to me. And, and I wonder, why is it like religion and politics? Well, it's the way he put it is that, that as you say, it's like religion and politics, it, and it's very visceral. People get really upset about all this stuff. And it says, you know, basically, don't, don't tell me the facts because in my heart, I know what's right. In my heart, I know it's true. So it is, it's a, it's, it's just a belief system that isn't necessarily rooted in fact. And, you know, people are very stubborn that way, <laughs> you know, and they, uh, They'll glom onto something, and if there's, for example, now in our period, there's a lot of new information and a lot of new science that digs into and is helping prove human evolutionary nutrition and evolutionary nutrition principles and, you know, ketogenic diets and paleo diets and all that kind of stuff and how good they are for us. And you get folks who don't want to believe in that, and it makes their heads spin. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I've experienced that. I know what it's like is you, you know, for 10 years, you, in, you invest in a certain way of living and, you know, you work really hard to be good at it. I mean, it was really hard when I was doing it to be a vegetarian and a vegan. There were none of these specialty foods, you know, none of the supplements. You actually had to eat vegetables, <laughs> you, mm. know? you know, raw foods and vegetables. You had to grow sprouts. You had to make your own, you know, salad dressing. 
eggs out of olive oil and Bragg's, you know, aminos and, you know, that kind of thing. And to try to do that and do it low fat, which was one of the beliefs as well, was really, really hard. So then, you know, you do that. And if you're successful at that and someone else comes along and say, oops, you didn't really have to do that. <laughs> you know, that not everybody wants to hear that message. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you yeah. mentioned people are quite stubborn to change. And I guess we're sort of coming up with a couple of different resistance. One, one is the belief system. And then also, I guess, <laughs> the public policy isn't really helping educate <laughs> people. In fact, yeah. quite the contrary. What are your thoughts around that? Well, you know, unfortunately, you know, one of my hopes, as you said in the summary to the film, is that I hoped that this new information that we've gathered would help elevate the conversation in public policy about health and well-being and as you know you're you're from australia now in hong kong it may be a little bit different there but here in the united states of course we have the food plate which used to be the food pyramid which is what is valid science is decided by a committee every five years and they say what they believe is right and wrong and all of the um, school children are fed based on what they have determined is what they believe is the right way to eat. And I heard this from other experts as well, like in Canada and whatnot, that that has become the entrenched belief system. Still lower fat, although now they're starting to back off and stay healthier fat, still lower saturated fat, even though the science now shows that saturated fat does not contribute to heart disease and mortality the way it has been claimed to. And you'd have to tell me if it's the same in Australia, but there's the government and the people, there's a lot of vested interests. And you know, if they're making their living or they're, you know, being paid to support a certain kind of an idea, the, when the new idea comes along, there's a lot of resistance again. And so this kind of a movement, these kinds of understandings, it really appears to be more of a bottom up kind of way of people understanding and getting their hands on the knowledge because there are just so many roadblocks in government, you know, things that people don't want to put into the conversation. You know, and as I was saying, like here in the United States, people submit all of the information now, but they say, oh, no, that needs more study and that's not valid. So we're still going to go with our old ideas. And a lot of, you know, like I said, that's influenced by, you know, the powers that be at the moment. So, mm. yeah, I think it's it'd be nice. I think the only thing that really shook people up here in the United States anyway was when the film Super Size Me came out because they got a little worried about childhood obesity. But that was also very you know, much more generalized than the things you and I are doing. Mm. Yeah. So what, like what you're doing is just sharing this information with other people on podcasts and in books and in training and, you know, weekend events and all those kinds of things is really the way that the ideas are, are spreading. Mm. And it's most likely the only way they'll take root um, mm. to a significant portion of the population. But I, that, of I guess, sorry, sorry, I guess the sad thing here is that the guideline, I mean, these guidelines that we're talking about on nutrition I, I've actually heard that they were, they were first written by politicians. Yes, staffers <laughs> that worked for the politicians. <laughs> and they haven't they, really they, changed. I mean, yeah, no, you mentioned no. they went from pyramid to plate, but, I mean, there wasn't much change <laughs> between pyramid and plate in terms of the actual information. Right. It's effectively hasn't changed. It's effectively the same, you know, certainly as it has for the last 15 years. And the only thing that's really changed in this last uh, version is that they've gotten savvier about the language so that it doesn't sound as onerous. But if you play out that language, the basic recommendations are still the same. They still believe in low fat dairy products. They still believe in restricting salt intake. They still believe in low saturated fats. They, you can eat a little more olive oil, a little more avocado and nuts and seeds, but not too much now. So, you know, it's still that. There's still a big belief that grains should be the foundation, the grains and uh, starchy foods and, and plant foods. I think that's the other part of it is that plant foods are really should form the foundation of a healthy and optimal diet. And there's, uh, you know, that's it just doesn't hold up to rigorous science, but that's what they have made the law of the land, mm. you know. So, so yeah, it's going to take a lot before those kind of things change. Well, but I guess, like I say, what yeah. you're doing is great. So, I guess we shouldn't we shouldn't criticize the food pyramid because I know the farmers are happy about it. I remember Michael Eads on the <laughs> uh, 
on, on your film suggested that that's what the farmers used to fatten up their um, animals. Well, yeah, it's, it was funny because I re- he had told me that story a number of years ago and I asked him to repeat it. And what he had did, he went to, you know, there was all this argument about eating the food pyramid and how healthy it was for you. And he figured out what the ratio of the um, elements of the food pyramid would be, you know, this percentage of grains and this percentage of, you know, vegetables and this percentage of fats and those kinds of things. And then went to a fellow that raised pigs and he said, you know, tell me pig jowl and you know when you raise your animals what do you use to fatten them up so the guy you know hands him these nutritional uh, ratios that they use with animals and then dr reeds puts them up side by side and they're virtually exactly the same so what the government was telling us to eat as healthy is the same formula that farmers were using to fatten up their animals so we called it the feedlot pyramid (laughs) instead of the food pyramid so um yeah, it's uh, it's pretty astounding. That's crazy. When you start, you know, checking these things out. Yeah, it's and most people don't hear about that kind of stuff. Mm. You know? I, I also liked in the film though where you talked about like the First Nations people and like the Aborigines in Australia and, and Canada and how they they sort of it was an intuition between how they found the links between their ancestral diet and evolutionary nutrition. And I wondered there seemed to be that instinct just seemed to sort of resonate with them and, and that's how they found the paleo diet quite sort of intuitive but but also just really resonated with them. And then have you found that it's harder to convince like modern Western people of the same connection due to the, the much longer period since their ancestors ate that way? Well, yeah, the, in general, at least in the United States and a, a few people that I've met in other countries is that we are very disconnected from where our food comes from. You know, most of us have grown up in circumstances where, you know, we didn't grow up on a farm, you know, we didn't go hunting, you know, and we went to the supermarket with mom or, you know, the family and, you know, found our food that way. So we don't have kind of the emotional, historical, uh, spiritual connection to some of these foods. And as you pointed out, when I went to the First Nations people in Canada, for example, um, this little village that I went into to visit with these people called the Namgis, they'd only had a road to get into their village for the last six years, you know, since about 2000. And so the only food that made its way in there happened to come over the trails or or was brought in by boat, you know, and that kind of thing because they were on the river. But they, they're particularly interesting because their ancestors used to harvest these fish and we show that in the film which i think you know your fans and your followers would be really interested in seeing is that they harvest these fish they learned to somehow intuitively learn to process them where they cook them in these vats and stir them for a week or so and then they skim off all the solid matter and the oil that is poured off is much like human body fat but it also doesn't spoil so they're able to then put it into you know sacks and whatnot and bury it and and use it as a normal part of their diet and as it turns out it was substantial it was upwards of 60 percent of their diet and they used it in all different kind of ways along with all the animals that they ate like you know beavers and seals and moose and bear and and uh, salmon they had lots of uh, salmon there and and that kind of thing and very little vegetables we spoke with a an, an old man there named george who he said his grandfather took him out and they you know, hunting. And he said, they got a few wild berries on occasion and a few green things, he says, but, you know, his grandfather had never even seen a vegetable, (laughs) you know, a cultivated one, right? That, and they had never been told that those were necessary. And then Dr. Jay Wartman, who is also in the film, has gone back to these populations that are now getting fat and obese and have lots of health problems because they've started eating a standard American diet or a traditional Western foods, which include you know flour and sugar and those kinds of things. And when you put them back on an Atkins-type diet or paleo-type diet, that they started recovering and their health all turned around. And you're right, they were able to identify with that a little better and understand it better because of that ancestral history in what were the native foods. You know, they could, it was easier for them to wrap their minds around. It says, well, yeah, this is the way our great grandparents ate. You know, maybe it is the way we're supposed to eat. You know, and, and in the United States, you know, you most of us probably don't know exactly what our great grandparents ate. So, <laughs> mm. although from what I understand, eighty years ago everything was organic. So, 
that was a little different. Sure, sure. So the film is great and and I felt that it sort of didn't need any more than just watching the film, but I did notice and I haven't seen your companion book. Why, why would that be worth getting? Well, I, I tell you, the here's what happened is the film came out and, you know, within that I think the – one of the big takeaways that I hope people get is that we have scientific proof of the authentic human diet. You know, now we know these are facts. These are not theories uh, because of this new type of bioanalysis that can be done and uh, that we show folks at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany in the film. And that knowing this, knowing what the authentic human diet was, was previously unknowable because the science didn't exist. You know, there was an assumption that we ate plant-based diets, but plant remains do not survive the same way bones do, animal bones and those kinds of things. And even those don't survive in the plains. They sur- The reason we hear about cavemen and why a lot of these discoveries are in caves is because they survive better there because they weren't you know, ruined and damaged by the rainfall and the weather. So the book came about because people kept writing. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm a reporter. I'm going to do this film, put it out there, hope people like it. But then people would write and ask, well, can I eat this? <laughs> can mm. I eat that? I said, because they, what they saw in the film attracted them and they didn't feel like they got enough uh, detailed guidance on how to put it into practice, even though people wrote and said, yeah, I've just been following everything you told me and what the doctor did in the store tour, and I've lost 20 pounds, and I feel better than ever, and my numbers are changing. There are still a lot of other people. They they just want to hold something in their hands and feel like they're someone is taking them through everything in baby steps and also telling them exactly what human foods are and exactly what non-human foods are. So uh, the book goes deeper into the why, uh, uh, this whole story of becoming human. It contains more of the things from the actual interviews with these world-class scientists. They couldn't be in a film. There's only so much you can put in a 90-minute film. You know, you can't cover all the territory. So it explains that better. And also what I try to do is introduce something, and I'm not sure what methodology you use within your training programs, but there's a different way of learning that's available to us where instead of trying to follow someone's prescription about how we should behave, the uh, prescriptions, as you probably know, and your audience probably knows, creates dependence or guru dependence on the person telling you exactly what you should be doing. And it doesn't help you learn how to put that into effect yourself effectively. And ultimately, the concepts that we get and the concepts we understand are what end up being our behavior. A lot of uh, you know, studies in psychology have shown that over time, like a college course you take, a lot of you forget the details, mm. but you re- remember the overall concepts. And those are the keys to truly successful life change is understanding the concept. Because otherwise you're just confused and once again trying to follow the latest diet book that came out. So, you know, in addition to adding more information about the research that came out of the investigation in the film. There's a discussion about why it's easier to do it this way, <laughs> you know, understand that. And it clearly defines what human foods are and non-human foods. We figured that, you know, the easiest way to set up people to win and to accurately describe the things that we discovered was instead of having, you know, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, sprouts, you know, 40 categories of meat, you know, all these different oils, all, you know, all the things that were confronted with today when we try to look at food lists and and what we should eat is that there really are only two categories of foods. There are human foods and non-human foods. And that's part of what was brought forward initially in the film, which and the human foods you might recall are things like meats, turkey, fish, chicken, you know, healthy fats, those kinds of things, healthy fats and oils and whatnot. And the non-human foods, as the way it was defined in Dr. Sebring's medical practice, were the grains, dairy, beans, and potatoes, and that those things were just not part of the normal human diet. And also by removing those from a person's current diet, they could get great positive results in whatever kind of health improvement they were trying to do. So it really becomes the how-to companion to the book to make it available for people. And after two years of telling people, you know, answering emails, you say, okay, fine, I'll write it down. Mm. So, you know, and make it easier, put it out there. You know, maybe it'll help some people find it that wouldn't find the film or might help people find the film that wouldn't otherwise see it. And, 
so that that's really what that is. And people mm-hmm. can find it, you know, like the film in your country where you're living now in Hong Kong. And it's uh, on Amazon and the film and on iTunes, subtitled in 12 languages. And and I went to check before we spoke today. And you can also get the book, the companion book um, through Amazon. So that's available all over the world, you know. Absolutely. And we'll definitely link to those in the show notes. And it makes sense, the companion book. I'll have to uh, check that out. And so I also heard a rumor that you are doing the perfect human diet too. And I was quite surprised because I think you've nailed it. I don't think we need another version. (laughs) What's another version for? Well, it's it's actually not another version of the first film. The first film is stands alone and is independent, you know, as the search for the perfect human diet. And here's what we discovered. And over the course of time, I think, as you're well aware, that there's a lot of misinformation that people believe is fact, again, about health and sustainability and animal foods. And are animal foods destroying the planet? And if we... you ate soy burgers every every day of the week instead of animal foods, it would stop global warming. You know, lots of that kind of thing. I'm, obviously, I'm exaggerating. But Rob Wolf and I talked about this. And what we thought was really important was to take the next step. And whereas it was wholly independent investigation on the first one, the second one is, what do we need to find in order to set the record straight? And it's to again, go and talk to world-class folks that work in the trenches, that have the science, that can answer these things in such a way that we can then go, aha, now I understand. And, you know, getting rid of every cow on the planet is not necessarily going to help us. You you know, Mm. it's so we get more into all of that idea of the regenerative agriculture versus um, simply trying to sustain things. I mean, nothing you know, vegetarian way of eating, what people don't seem to question very often is not sustainable. (laughs) So Mm. I don't know why they're just fussing about animal products. It's, you know, the water it takes, the land it takes, the fact that when you want to grow wheat or corn, you have to kill everything else that existed, you know, on the land and monocrop, you know, so there's, there's a lot of things that when you see it in a film, when you see it in pictures, it helps you understand better once again the concept and then you can make better decisions and i think as far as as you said about politics and and influencing um people's health and well-being and all that it, there really needs to be an understanding about what is accurate you know mm. who's right in this debate is you know just because arnold schwarzenegger all of a sudden says okay i'm going to not eat steaks and I'm going to have Meatless Monday because his friend Jim Cameron, who made you know the Titanic and Avatar, went that way. It's kind of interesting. There's a lot of that Hollywood stuff going on that I just kind of go, really? Okay, Arnold Schwarzenegger is trying to eat less meat. So <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you hear about much about that kind of stuff over there, but it's we kind do. of interesting here. We do. Well, that's yes, interesting. So, that. so how do how do our listeners find out about when that when that comes out? Because I definitely want to uh, know as soon as it comes out. Well, the, the easiest thing to do right now is to go to my website, which is CJ Hunt Reports. If you put in perfecthumandiet.com or theperfecthumandiet.com, it'll roll over to CJ Hunt Reports. And there, like on most people's websites, there's a little sign-up box for the newsletter. And, you know, I don't spam people and I don't try to sell 100 things like a lot of folks do. I just put out little newsletters every once in a while that will include, you know, the new projects and how it's going and how people might participate if they want to get involved, that sort of thing. So that's the easiest thing to do. It's just Okay. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you, well, actually two more things, but I get a lot of, um, say, I guess, negative feedback about the primal paleo way of, of life with the most common sort of, I guess, statement being – it's, it's just a fad. It's just a fad. And I loved in your film, um, I think it was Boyd Ede who says, two million-year-old fad. It's a two million-year-old <laughs> fad. Um, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought that was a great quote too. It's like, well, if this is a fad, it's a two million-year-old fad. It's like, hang on, folks. How are we defining a fad? You know, that's a passing way of people doing things that is recently invented. 
you know, so it's clearly, it's not a fad, you know, and that will be one of the first things that people, you know, fuss about. I mean, you know, there are even people in the paleo sphere, you know, the paleo world itself that, you know, want to change the science because they like to eat potatoes, <laughs> you know, and stuff. So they say, ah, oh, well, it's just kind of sort of there and it's just a template and, you know, I don't really have to do that. And, you know, of course, no one has to do any of that kind of stuff, but that that's no reason to discount the hard science that we do have, you know, that uh, just puts you in a better position to make the decisions you want to make. Absolutely. Yeah. So I often get that. What do you hear the most about what you're doing and what, what you're actually proving through science is actually wrong? Oh, you know, I think most of the, if you would want to call it pushback, I mean, on my website or via email or in reviews of the movie and stuff, the only people that are really kind of ultra harsh are vegetarians who don't like the message, including a lot of folks. It's interesting, people in the, the vegetarian vegan world, without ha ever having seen the film or read the reading the book, will come out and attack you. And I don't know if that's just as true in the paleo world, if you know, the ancestral health side does that to the um, vegetarian movies or that kind of thing. But those are the folks with the most, that are the most upset. And uh, I don't know, my old, my old professor from school where I, where I, San Francisco State, when I first showed the film in San Francisco, and I said, you know, all these people are upset and they're, they're, they're really getting bent out of shape. And he said, well, if they're getting that upset, you must be doing something right. So <laughs> I always thought that was a, uh, a nice thing. And, and then in, in the ancestral health world, I think it's like any kind of dietary system is that people have different comfort levels. You know, there's some people who are, you know, super athletic and they're still very young and whatnot, and they can fudge it a lot more and they can have a lot more leeway with the kind of things that they eat and still feel good and look good and, and perform well without being as uh, rigorous about following things to the letter. Of course, I think because of myself and my heart condition, and there are a lot of people, of course, that don't have those advantages, that it serves them to you know, stick to their guns a little bit more, even if though sometimes it may be a struggle when you're first learning. I think ultimately it's really easy. It's like, I really love savory food. I don't really like sweets, I, you know, grains and things like that. If I were to taste them now, I just think they taste starchy and I don't find them appealing. So I think that's really the main thing, you know, that folks in the ancestral health world, there's a hundred different versions of paleo now, mm. <laughs> you know, mm. it's just, well, and I think it's interesting because, you know, especially even when paleo was brand new and it was only a year or two old, you know, you got folks who, I'm thinking of one young man, he's 20, 21 years old, he lost 20 pounds. So now, you know, he has become the expert. And I kind of go, well, <laughs> okay. So, you know, it, I'm glad it worked for you, but it, it doesn't mean you should, in my personal opinion, that you should be telling people, well, they, these are the facts because I was able to do this. So this is what is true about the paleo diet or paleolithic diet. I think perhaps the thing that could be most helpful in this is that people compare in, you know, in our uh, different ancestral health movements, keep quoting two or two and a half million years as anything they ate in that time is the authentic human diet. And what I like to bring forward, again, as I mentioned a little earlier, is that, well, wait a minute, there were no humans until about 160,000 years ago. So the real human diet, the real paleo diet that is relevant to the human species is only the what they call the upper Paleolithic. It's the last part of the Paleolithic era. And in that period, we were top-level carnivores along with bears and wolves and things like that, at least in Northern Europe. And um, I don't think you have to you know, throw away the science in order to still get good effect from the things that have been discovered there. And I don't know that you have to build your career on bashing the science in order to have a wider audience. I think you probably know that the more you simplify things and make it less rigorous and ask people to do less, the more popular it becomes. <laughs> so. Absolutely. In fact, that's an interesting point because I run a 21-day transformation challenge, which is basically primal living. And a lot of my clients at the end of it just say, I just love how simple it was. It's just simple. Mm. It's just 
it's intuitive. It's easy. It's it's not hard. It doesn't have to be hard. So I think you're yeah. absolutely right. Well, and I think you're right too. <laughs> <laughs> so so no, I note, agree with you. It sh- it shouldn't be it shouldn't be difficult. It really is pretty straightforward and simple. So on that note, absolutely nothing to do with what we've discussed today. Bit of a personal question: Do you have a tattoo? Me? Mm. No, I'm actually from the pre-tattoo era. You know, I'm 63 now, and I don't know if Mark Sisson has one because he's maybe 64. But um, tattoos, when I was growing up, when I was 21, you know, or when I was 24 in 1978, the only people that really had tattoos outside of people that were um, hobbyists and people that uh, did tattoos as art and those kinds of things were in the military. And they usually only had small ones like USMC, you know, or the Navy, you know, those kinds of things. Tattoo, the whole tattoo thing to me looks like a very recent phenomenon and it's everywhere i mean in connecticut now and everywhere i go you know people riding down the street on their bicycle or at the supermarket and um i think it's an interesting change but no no tattoos just a appendectomy scar from (laughs) dicks at 11 years old so if you had grown up in that uh, tattoo era what do you think you would have got oh as a tattoo Hmm. if i was gonna get one my gosh well if it were now, you see, I've gone through some different things because of dropping dead. I went through a very spiritual search period and, you know, that symbology might be different than it would be now. I think now, although I don't know how nice it would look, uh, you know, I'd probably have a steak, you know, <laughs> you know on my, something, something simple like that. You know, my I think favorite just as well, just as well, you don't have one then. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's just as well too, you know, you have the, the poster from the film on my shoulder. It probably wouldn't look so good. Absolutely. You know, other than that, I'd have to, you know, find something from the Game of Thrones or, you know, that's that's kind of edgy, I guess. Okay, but, so uh, just yes. stay, stay away from any tattoo parlors then. I, I have to. I'm pretty old. <laughs> fat. I don't, no one's going to come over to your place and say, hey, you know, he's really hip. CJ, just, just stick, <laughs> stick to making informative doc- documentaries, I think. Thank you very much. I mean, I <laughs> tie, you know, what's with that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. And I know our listeners will be looking out for the perfect human diet too, like I will be. Well, thank you so very much, Anna. And it's, like I said, it's easily accessible, you know, on iTunes in 12 languages for anyone who can hear your voice. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll be linking to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. I really appreciate it. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.